Thank you for coming today. It's Father's Day, June 16th here in Port Aransas, Texas. So I'd like to give a special thank you to all the men who have chosen to be fathers. You have a great example. You have our Father in Heaven who shows you how to love your children. So thank you for choosing to love your children today and to be fathers to them. Thank you, Father in Heaven, this day, for choosing us to be your children, that we are chosen to be loved by you, and we honor you as well, Father, today. Yes. This is your day, God. Yes. Thank you for accepting us as your children. Please speak to us, Father God. I pray right now for everyone listening that you will hear his word in your heart, in your mind, that he will speak a word to you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus uh, told a parable when he was here on, on earth, and it was about the narrow gate. Today we're going to look closely at this, and what exactly does it mean? In Matthew 7, chapters 13, er, verses, verses 13 through 14, Jesus actually said, enter through the narrow gate. Notice we have a narrow gate that says Jesus, and we have a wide gate. He said, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Right. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. He's talking about eternal life. Salvation. Does it worry you when Jesus says, do you believe him? Only a few find it. That concerns me. Because I love so many people. And to think that only a few will find the gate that leads to salvation. And it's so easy to get caught up with the world on the wide path that everyone's going instead of choosing the path to Jesus. So today, God is calling you to make sure that you're on that narrow path because he wants you to have life everlasting with him and his kingdom. But what is salvation. We're going to start with Jesus because he spoke about what it takes to be saved, to enter into the kingdom of God. Don't you think we should start with the authority? The one who provides that entry? So we're going to start with what Jesus had to say on salvation. In Mark and actually in all of the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are called synoptic gospels. That means that they are all similar. They cover many of the similar stories of Jesus. And they document, they support each other in what they say. Now John is a little different. People think the gospel of John was written later. They, and John said, you guys missed some stuff. I'm going to write, I want to write what everybody else missed. So it's not really the same. But this is a story This is a, uh, that was told by all three of them. Not all things are told in all three. Very few are. Often it's only two. But this is such an important time that it was recorded three times. When something is said three times, do you think you should listen? <laughs> I think that says it's important to me. So we're going to read Mark's version. Chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And... I'm going to read to you in the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version of the Bible actually has parentheses, and it explains some of the more difficult words to understand. But it's important that we understand what Jesus is saying. So here he goes. Here we go. So as he, was, when, as he the capital H means it was Jesus, as he was leaving on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, by the way, what this word good means is you are essentially good and morally perfect. See, in, in good today, good is like, eh, it's passable, right? But what this word means, good teacher, it means that you are a 
morally perfect. It's a much higher standard than what we see good today. So here's the picture, what's happening. Jesus was getting ready to leave town. And this man runs up to him and says, oh, you are the perfect moral example, and gets on his knees. Hey, that's high praise, right? And, then the, uh, and he says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Hey, that, that's plain and simple. You want eternal life? That's called salvation. Amen. And Jesus is going to answer this question for everyone today. And that is eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom, kingdom of God. And Jesus said this to him. First of all, why do you call me good? You see, Jesus was always under attack as being false. And so he's going to say, you need to confirm to me that you mean what you say. He says, no one is essentially good except by nature, except God alone. So in essence, he's saying, I'm the son of God. If you think that I'm perfect morally, you're equating me with God. So in this one statement, Jesus is letting you know the authority that he has. He's acknowledging that he came from God. That would be the only way that he would be good, according to the standard as it's written. And then he answers the question, and he says, you know the commandments. What commandments? Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely. Do not defraud, which means cheat, and honor your father and mother. Now these five, two, three, four, five, six... These six are recorded in each of the Gospels. But there's only, only six. How many commandments are there in the Bible, guys? How many? Yeah. How many? Ten. Jesus is only saying five. Or six. What's up with that? That was the first question that hit me as I read this. Why did he stop? These are the commandments that have to do with how we treat each other. You see, the first four is how we treat God. It's honor God, don't have idols, uh, don't, uh, don't yeah, keep the Sabbath. They're all about honoring God, who God is, right? Don't use God's name in vain, that's the word, by the way. So we've got the first four commandments are about how we treat God. This man was a Hebrew. We'll find out that later for sure. But he is a Hebrew. He knew God only. He knew how to honor God. But Jesus is telling him, you must do things correctly here on this earth. You know the commandments, right? So in Matthew 19, 19, Matthew includes another one. And love your neighbor as yourself. And we know what that means because we've studied it. Unself and selfishly seek the best or higher good for others. Love is not an emotion, it's an action. Are you loving to others? Do you see that you want to make sure they're taken care of before you even want to take care of yourself, or is it all about you? So these are, this is the first standard that Jesus is, is putting out there. And the man replied to him, Teacher, I have carefully kept all these commandments since my youth. So he says, no problem, I've done it. You see, Jesus, even when he saw this man, he knew that he feared God. Because Jesus knows people's hearts. He didn't have to preach to him about honoring God. And this man is confirming, I've been a good person. Does being a good person get you into heaven? <laughs> no. Jesus, it doesn't mean we don't need to do it, but that's not all, because looking at, he, at him, Jesus felt a love for him. This love is agape, meaning a, a sincere compassion and pity on someone. Why would Jesus have this love for him? He says he's kept these commandments. This is what he says. This is what Jesus says to him. You lack one thing. Go sell all your property and give the money to the poor. And you will have abundant treasure, treasure in heaven. And, notice the word and. So you have to give up everything you have and come follow.
follow me, becoming my disciple and believing and trusting in me, and walking the same path of life that I walk. Now here's the thing, a lot of cults have been born out of this verse. Because there's a lot of cults that say you have to sell all your possessions and give them to whoever the leader is. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying you have to put me and doing what I'm doing above all your possessions. He doesn't literally want you to sell them, but would you give them up if he asked you to? Do you love him enough to give up the possessions you have in this world? But this word and, and, follow me. He didn't say believe in me. He didn't say believe that I'm the Messiah. He didn't say get baptized. They were doing that then. John baptized Jesus. He said follow me. Do what I do. Be my disciple to have eternal life. Y'all, that's the standard. I want to believe that my friends and family are saved and are going to see me in heaven. Some of you who have children want to desperately believe that if something happens to your child tomorrow, you will see them in heaven. Amen. But are they following Jesus? Are you encouraging them to follow Jesus? Because that's what it takes, according to Jesus. I mean, not my words, his words. They can be good people. You can be a really great person and really follow all the Ten Commandments to the best of your ability. Jesus said, that doesn't get you in. He said, you've got to follow me. And now I'm going to hear you screaming at me online right now. What about saved by grace? I grew up Baptist, Right? I grew up Baptist, and I was told, all I have to do to get saved is to get baptized. you got to confess that you believe in Jesus and get baptized. Then you're done. It's like, woohoo, kingdom, here I come. <laughs> I mean, that is the celebration that happens in a lot of churches. And that comes from this verse in Ephesians. Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus. The church is there. More than one probably read this. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Because Paul writes, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Amen. Your faith, your belief in Jesus, and grace is what saved you. He says, and it's not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Right? So is that contradicting what Jesus said about following him? Actually, it's not. <laughs> Here's the thing. To receive your salvation... It's your faith, and you don't have to go and slaughter any animals. It's grace. It's a gift. Up until this time, if you wanted to be forgiven of sins, you had to make an animal sacrifice. How did that start, by the way? Adam and Eve. When they discovered they were naked, God had to kill an animal to make them clothes out of animal skins. Okay? So here we go. It is not something that you can pay for. You can come to Jesus when you are broken, when you are sinful. You don't have to clean up your life. You don't have to go make things right. I hear people say, well, i got to clean things up before I come to Jesus. No, you don't. He'll clean you up. Amen. It's a free gift. All you have to do is come. That's it. To be saved. To receive salvation. And he says it's not by works. You can't do enough to earn it. Right. You're going to get it free. So that you cannot brag about it and say, oh, look what I did to get saved. See, he doesn't want braggarts. But here's the thing. Some people forget the next verse. People stop here and go, look, I'm saved. That's all that counts. You should never just stop reading in the Bible. You should always, like, read some verses after, read some verses before, so you get the whole context. <laughs> Instead of cherry-picking a verse. Because the next one says, for, which means because, we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ to do good works. See, when you get saved, it's for a reason. To do something. To do good stuff. It's not just so you can go out and party all the time. And wait for heaven to come. 
It's because you're created to do good works. Because God has prepared them in advance for us to do so. Amen? Amen. Before I really started walking with God, he prepared me to be a pastor. I was living for myself and partying it up. I was making my own money and never talked to God except for on Easter and Christmas. And do you know he still prepared me to do the work? Amen. He, he, I went to college and he, he guided me to teaching. So I, public speaking, so I could get up in front of y'all and speak without being afraid. He taught me how to preach before he asked me to preach. He prepared the work for me and he prepared me for the work. Even before I started walking with him. So here's the thing. Salvation is free. It's by grace that you've been saved. Man, don't clean up your act first like God clean up your act once you come to him. But there is a reason you are saved. There's a reason why he calls you in and says, take this free gift of being with me forever. The reason is it's because he has work for you to do. He wants you to come and be his child. Don't you know children do the work of the Father? You may do good works. So, any other verses that back this up in the Bible? You never take just one. You also look for backup here. Romans 10, 9 talks to us about salvation. Paul's writing to the churches in Rome. And he's telling them what to do to be saved. Here's another verse. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will have salvation. Amen. So it's what you do with your mouth and what's in here. You believe that he was raised from the dead because he is the son of God. He said, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. Justified, by the way, we're going to look at that word here in a minute. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So this seems to be opposite to you. It says you're saved. Well, you're saved by grace. These are easy things to do. It's not costing you anything. It's in your heart and what comes out of your mouth. Amen. But let's look at a deeper implication of what these words actually mean about receiving salvation. You have to look at the meaning of the words. Believe to be justified. What does justified mean? When you believe in your heart, that means you have pistis, which is faith. Justified, dikaia sune, dikaia sune is the Greek word. It means ex you are being made acceptable to God. See, when you believe, you are justified, which is how your sins are washed away. See, God cannot be in front of sin. He can't have sin in front of him. But your belief in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God washes your sins away. So you can have a relationship with God. But that is not all. It's not just a heart thing. You have to do something with your mouth. Remember, there are two things you have to do. We have to have a heart right, and we have to have a mouth. You must profess. We don't use the word profess very much today. That word is homo lego, logeo. That's like, uh, like a logo, something you speak out of your mouth. Homo means yourself doing it. One, yeah. To declare fully, implying the yielding or changing of one's convictions. So you have to declare publicly and fully that I 100% believe something. I am changing what I used to be and doing something new. What are you changing? Well, you have to profess Jesus as Lord. You have to profess Jesus as Lord. Remember? In the first part of our verse, what does it mean, Jesus as Lord? You call him the Lord of your life, right? Yeah. Do you actually know what you're saying? What does that mean? The word is curios. Curios. A person exercising absolute ownership rights. Did you know that you're signing your life over to Jesus Amen. when you profess him as Lord? Amen. It means that you no longer are living your life just for you, but it actually belongs to Jesus who is over you. It means he, has, he is your master. We are slaves to Jesus, right? The one who has complete control of another person. You have to yield your own 
control to Jesus. What are you going to do with that? What does what he ask you to do when you yield control? Follow him. You see how this supports what Jesus is saying? He says, follow me. You're yielding control of your life to follow Jesus instead of what you want to do. Completely supports what Jesus was saying. You must follow him as well. Not just believe. Not just try to do good, but follow him. But there are a lot of people who are deceived today. And this deception started in the 1900s with this, I'm saved by grace, I'm one and done, and we're done. We got baptized, we had a nice little bath, and now we're good. And actually, Paul writes about this deception in Galatians 6, 7, actually. He says, do not be, see, be deceived, and God is not mocked. Mocked is to be made fun of. There are some people who are deceived, and in their deception, they're mocking, they're making fun of God. And this is how they're doing it. For whatever a man sows, he will reap. For what he who sows to please his flesh, which is your own self and your own needs, will reap of the flesh, will reap corruption. But he who sows to please the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. What you do matters. By the way, sowing, he's not sowing it on thread, means planting, creating, cultivating. Are you cultivating and your, all your energy is going just for you to have a good time? Because the, the result of that is reaping corruption or death. We must work on doing what pleases the Spirit of God, who is in you, teaching you, and guiding you to do God's will above our own. So... You hear from God every day? Most days? I try to start my day with God. Say, God, what will you have me do today? What is on your agenda for my life? I want to reap everlasting life in this world. In Hebrews 10, 26, this is, they don't know if Paul wrote this or James. There's some kind of confusion because the author doesn't state who he is. He says, he also says this, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. Remember these people who say, we talk about them a lot, I'm going to go sit on Saturday and pray for forgiveness on Sunday? The whole Mardi Gras experience, man, I'm going to go out and do as much bad as I can because I'm going to have to be good for 40 days. You know what that's called? Willfully sinning. It's called an iniquity. And you know what this, this says? Jesus was sacrificed for your sins, but if you already asked for forgiveness for your sins, but you do it on purpose anyway, even though you know it's a sin, there's not a sacrifice for that anymore. Does that worry you just a little bit? I can tell you why. Because you're not following him if you're willfully just sinning all the time. Amen. And if you're not following him, are you truly saved? You see, it's all together the same. He says there's an expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. What are the adversaries? The adversaries of God. He's talking about the last days, the fires of hell that are going to devour God's adversaries. If you are willfully sinning, you're putting yourself in that category with those lost people. How much more severe do you think someone who deserves to be punished, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot foot, and who has treated an unholy thing as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? Did you know when you willfully sin, you're trampling Jesus underfoot? I want you to think about this when you are tempted in the future to do something that you know is wrong. When you know that you're being tempted to sin, I want you to look at Jesus and be like, I'm going to just go sin anyway. I don't care that you died for me. Did you know that's what you're doing? You're insulting the grace that he's given you. In fact, that's what it says right here. Who has insulted the spirit of grace. 
Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. I've had to repent. Because I've backslidden in my life. And I had to come to him and say, sorry, God, I didn't even know I was supposed to be talking to you. I didn't know I was supposed to be listening. I thought I was done with baptism. He will forgive you when you truly repent in your heart. But this willful sinning has to stop, y'all. There are consequences for that that can be very harmful to you in life and in death. We have to seek to do what's right by the Spirit of God. So we're going to do a salvation check today. I want everybody right now taking a deep breath and say, Lord, speak to my heart. Everyone, Lord, speak to my heart. Lord, speak to my heart. Tell me. If there's anything that needs to change. Amen. Romans 6, 1 through 4. We're back to the church in Rome, by the way. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in grace, in sin, so that grace may abound? I've heard, I've heard people say that I'm going to continue to sin because there's a lot of grace out there. No. He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? When you, are, when you are baptized, you die. The going down under the water signifies that you are dead to the sin in your life, by the way. He said, or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Just like he died, you died. Your sin died. Your sinful nature died. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in a newness of life. You see, when you are raised in baptism, you are here declaring that I am a new person. All that sin is gone. I'm going to walk like Jesus from now on. Now, we do make mistakes. God knows I make my fair share, and I have to come back and ask him to teach me again. But you try to do better instead of willfully doing bad. Do you see the difference there? You try. And you allow the Spirit to speak to you. 1 Corinthians 10.5 says, this is how we do a check. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. We should test ourselves, by the way, daily. Is Jesus guiding what I'm doing or not? Am I failing that test today? Periodically, I fail, even today. But periodically, I let that old person come out and do things that are very unpleasant. <laughs> it, it, my husband chuckles at that because he's seen it. And I have to repent and say, oh, God, I'm sorry. That wasn't Jesus in me. That was me acting in me, the old me. I've made a mistake. Forgive me. The sooner we can get to that place where we re recognize it and repent, the better it is. Here's our solution today. How do we get past the old me into the new me? Romans 12. The whole book of Romans, by the way, is, him, is uh, Paul telling the churches in Rome how to be Christians. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole book of Romans. Yeah. If you want to learn about salvation and what they're doing wrong and the bad problems that you can have and how to fix them, read Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We have to transform from that old life that was in the world to the new life in Jesus. We must renew our minds Daily. Here's a challenge. Salvation check. Read your word every day. Read one Bible verse. One Bible verse every day. Renew your mind and focus on Jesus. Just once. To help you learn to walk like him. And keep you focused on him. I was telling my sister today, she's visiting my, um, my uh, ringtone is a Jesus song. And it's because sometimes I get irritated if I'm interrupted. 
and I can get snappish and not very nice. So something that irritates me, what I do is I replace it with reminding me of how much I love Jesus and to be like him. Some of you might need to do that with things that irritate you. Something irritates you, put a big Jesus sign right in the middle of it to remind you that you don't, you can be loving even if you're irritated. You can be kind when it's not easy to be kind. Ephesians 5, 17 through 18, therefore do not be unwise, but understand that the will, what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a big uh, hang up for a lot of people. How can you understand what the will of God is? Sometimes it's really hard to understand. And sometimes when we're confused, we just go, oh, might as well have a drink and relax and forget about it. Anybody ever do that? I used to be very bad at that. And we're not to get drunk on wine, but to be filled with the Spirit instead. Amen. People drink too much because they're hurting usually. Or they're overloaded. And so they go and they turn to alcohol to relax them. Here's the solution. The alcohol is just going to make you act like the world and embolden your flesh. Instead, we need to ask the Spirit of God to come into us and fill us and help us deal with whatever we're dealing with. Yes. Don't go to the bottle. Just say it. I've had experience with that. All that does is embolden the bad behavior and quiet the Spirit of God. Instead, we turn to the Spirit. Notice how these are all focused on the Holy Spirit here. The last solution, 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, to remember a lot of people have a hard time because they have guilt. Guilt will make you drink. Anybody drink because you feel bad about yourself? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> you feel like you can't be good? I went, I went through a divorce, and I was convinced by the Baptist church that now I was imperfect and never could be perfect enough. And when uh, I thought I was such a bad person that I was no good, I really did. I thought I would never be useful to God. And I, I began to drink, actually. Another reason why I drank. <laughs> Might as well. I can't, be, I can't be used by God, which is a total lie, by the way. If you've gotten divorced, God still loves you. There is forgiveness. He still has a purpose for you. He can still work with you. He says, because you were washed and you were sanctified. To be sanctified, hagaizo, hagaizo, means to be made holy. Holy is not perfect, by the way. Every single one of you are holy. What that means is when you receive Jesus, God has a purpose for you and you're set apart and he has a plan. You're not like the rest of the people who are on that big wide path. You're on that narrow path, which means you're set apart and you are holy. You are sanctified. And when you are sanctified, you're being made holy. Okay? Sanctification is God's work in you to help you to be on his path of life. You were justified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is when you were forgiven of your sins. You were made justified. Remember, we studied the justified word. Acceptable to God. Forgiven by Jesus' sacrifice for you. And by the Spirit of our God. If you don't speak to God on a regular basis... You don't hear from him. You can speak to him, and we talked about this last week. But you also need to receive from him. Yes. You need to receive from God. And we hear and are justified and sanctified by his spirit who speaks to us and within us. He teaches us to be holy. He teaches us to walk as God would have us walk. And his spirit is so comforting. Because you're never alone when you have the Holy Spirit. Right. You're never lonely. You always have him. You know, little kids have imaginary friends. Because they don't want to be especially only children. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is not imaginary. He is very real. And when you learn to hear his voice inside of you, you're never lonely. You have your friend. And here. And speaking to you in here. And helping you to 
do the will of God. It's not your strength. It is God's strength working in you. Now, I'm probably preaching to the choir for the people here. I'm just saying. I know the people at Sandcastle Church love God. Amen. And I witnessed them working hard on their salvation. Working hard to do the right thing even when it's not fun. I'm very blessed to have a congregation that I love and that I see saved. Just to be frank, I see each and every one of you saved. But do you know somebody who needs to hear this message? Do you know somebody who maybe they don't know they're supposed to be following Jesus? Like me, I was deceived for years. I didn't know I even had to have a conversation with God. I didn't know I was supposed to be hearing from him. In fact, I, I was told that God doesn't really speak to us anymore. <laughs> the voice that I kept thinking was God, I went to my pastor with, and he said, oh, no, 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 that's probably the devil. God doesn't speak to people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> I was so confused for so much of my salvation. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. But God is merciful, and he is so gracious. Because all that time that I was lost, he was preparing me for today. He was still guiding me and protecting me and getting me ready for the work he had for me. So if you know somebody who needs to hear this word, share it with them. Share with them. And say, hey, I just wanted to share a service with you that I heard today. Share a word with I heard for you today. And that's hard to do, I understand, because you don't want to be seen as preachy, right? But would you rather somebody you know die and go to hell? Just saying. You have to look and say, I can step out there. That's what got me going, by the way. It's because I just don't want people to die without being saved. Do you love someone enough in your life to step out there and say, are you saved? Are you going to meet Jesus when you die? We need to be willing to share him with others yes. and share the truth with others. It's more than words you say. It's what you do afterwards. After you say those words that you follow him and you listen to him, that you make your life about him more than you. That is salvation. And we need to walk as an example, walk as a testimony, and when moved by the, by the Lord and the Holy Spirit, share with others our testimony. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope to see you next week. Next week, we're going to really talk about sharing Jesus, about what it means to actually follow. What is he calling you to do? If you're still looking for something to do for God and haven't found what the work that God has for you, you really need to come back next week. Because he wants to help you find your path. 